Welcome to this course on environmental literacy or demonstrate environmental literacy. I am your moderator and I'll be taking you through this course. Kindly follow me until the end of the session. By the end of this course, you're expected to have learned the following. One, control of environmental hazards. Two, control of environmental pollution. Three, demonstrating sustainable resource use. Four, Evaluate current practices in relation to resource usage. 5. Identify environmental legislations or conventions for environmental concerns. Uh, 6. Implement specific environmental programs. And lastly, monitor activities on environmental protection stroke programs. We are going to start by some definition of key terms. One is environment, and when we talk about environment, it is everything that encompasses the physical, chemical, and biological elements that influence the form of an organism and its survival. Uh, it encompasses both the living and unliving components. Next is environmentally hazardous material. From this, we derive the word hazard. A hazard is anything that has uh, the potential to cause harm. So when you're talking about environmentally hazardous materials, these substances possess the potential to endanger the surroundings by negatively impacting the health of plants and animals, as well as causing pollution and natural disasters. Personal protective equipment, or what we call PPE, it refers to the garments or materials which are worn to protect individuals from various hazards such as injuries or infections. Environmental Management and Coordination Act, EMCA, of 1999. The EMCA 1999 is a legal framework established to facilitate environmental management and conservation in Kenya. This act was recently revised in 2015 in order to align to the 2010 Kenyan Constitution. Lastly is the Occupational Safety and Health Standards. So they comprise guidelines and principles designed to promote a safe and healthy work environment. We are going to start with the control of environmental hazards. The globally harmonized systems categorize hazardous materials into different classes and categories based on their physical, health, and environmental hazards. One, we have physical hazards. This category includes classes related to physical properties of chemicals that can lead to accidents or pose risk during storage, handling, or transportation. These hazards can include explosives, flammable gases, liquids and solids, oxidizing substances, and substances under pressure. Two, we have environmental hazards. This category focuses on the potential harm to the environment, including aquatic ecosystems resulting from the release or exposure of hazardous substances. It includes the classification of substances that are hazardous to the aquatic environment meaning they can cause adverse effects to aquatic organisms or ecosystems. Thirdly, we have health hazards. This category addresses the potential adverse effects on human health resulting from exposure to hazardous substances. It includes classes such as acute toxicity, which refers to the potential for immediate health effects or even fatality from short-term exposure, skin corrosion stroke irritation, which denote substances that can cause severe damage or irritation to the skin. Serious eye damage or irritation, which indicate substances that can cause severe damage or irritation to the eyes. Respiratory or skin sensitization, which refers to substances that can in induce allergic reactions and germ cell mutagenicity, carcinogenicity, reproductive toxicity, and specific target organ toxicity which indicate potential for long-term health effects. When we talk about mutagenicity, we are talking about a substance that has the ability to cause mutation, and carcinogenicity refers to the ability of a substance to cause cancer. There are various storage methods for environmentally hazardous materials, which you must follow. One, ensure that you follow all the storage instructions on the product label. Storage requirements vary based on the material's hazardous properties. 2. 
Be sure to store all volatile products in a well-ventilated area. Fumes can be toxic, especially to living things. 3. Make sure you store flammable products in the recommended temperature range. Containers may expand if you store them in too high temperatures. And in too low temperatures, liquid materials will expand, freeze, and burst if you store them. 4. Keep all hazardous materials out of children's reach and away from animals. This can be done through 1. Covering materials with safety lids whenever possible and putting all hazardous materials start, uh, start behind locked doors. 5. Use the original container to store the hazardous materials. 6. Reduce the amount of hazardous materials you keep in storage. Buy only the amount that you require for your task. And then lastly, do regular maintenance of storage areas. Ensure that you do regular cleanups and inspection of the, of the storage areas. Storage methods for environmentally hazardous materials can be resolved by answering the following four questions. One, what materials are being stored? Understanding the, the properties of hazardous materials is very important. Uh, you have to understand the physical or chemical or biological properties of the materials. Two, why are the materials being stored? The ways should be developed to either use less hazardous materials or reduce the quantity of the materials stored. 3. Where is the material being stored? Ensure that storage is clearly defined as permanent, temporary, or transit location. Transient means it's being transported to a different location. 4. How is the material being stored? You should always review the local, federal, okay, this is in the US, but in Kenya you should review the national regulations on how to store these materials. Here, you also ask yourself, what type of container do you use? There are various disposal methods for environmentally hazardous materials. We're going to be discussing them in the coming slides. One, we have incineration. Incineration is a method where waste substances are burned at high temperatures, effectively destroying and reducing most of the waste. One advantage of incineration is that it can convert flammable waste into energy sources when burned. However, a drawback of incineration is that it can release toxic gases into the environment. To address this issue, modern incinerator units have been developed with improved technology in order to limit emissions. Secondly, we have recycling. Recycling involves reusing or repurposing waste materials. In the case of e-waste, Parts from a discarded phones or computers can be used to repair other broken devices. Recycling helps to reduce waste and conserve resources by giving materials a new life. Third, we have landfill disposal. Landfill disposal is a method of storing solid hazardous waste underground. Landfills for hazardous waste are lined with a double layer of non-porous material, such as clay, to prevent the leaching of harmful substances. After waste is dumped, the landfills are covered to prevent animals and insects from accessing the waste. However, a downside of land, landfill disposal is that it requires a significant amount of space. The fourth point is dumping at sea. Dumping hazardous waste at sea involves depositing, kindly note this down, and highlight it and put it in bold, treated waste into deep ocean waters in order to minimize its impact on groundwater sources. So the waste has to be treated in order for it to be dumped in uh, oceans. This method is however under high scrutiny and even banned in most parts of the world in order to protect marine ecosystems and preserve the blue economy. The last point is underground disposal. Underground disposal also is also referred to as injection wells. It is considered one of the most suitable and cost-effective method for disposing of radioactive waste. It is typically performed in an inhabited areas, meaning areas that have no people, such as active mine, inactive mines that meet specific geological and technical criteria. This method involves injecting hazardous waste deep into the ground. 
Examples of waste suitable for underground disposal include medical treatments, brain from mining of radioactive ores, and the production of nuclear fuel. Lastly, in this topic, we're going to be covering PPEs. PPEs refers to personal protective equipment. They are special clothing, gear, or tools that are made to keep you safe from things that can hurt you or make you sick. It is important to remember that PPE doesn't make the danger go away, but it helps to protect your body if something bad like an accident happens. When selecting personal protective equipment, PPE, several factors need to be considered to ensure its effectiveness and suitability for the intended use. Here are some of the, fa the important factors to consider. 1. Nature of the hazard. Assess the specific hazards present in the work environment. Identify, identify the type of potential injury or exposure such as impact, chemical splashes, respiratory hazards, heat or noise. 2. Level of protection. Determine the level of protection required to mitigate the identified hazards. This involves understanding the performance standards and specifications for different types of PPE and select the appropriate level of protection based on the severity of the hazards. 3. Fit and comfort. PPE should fit properly and comfortably on the wearer to ensure optimal protection. It is important to consider factors such as size, adjustability, weight, ergonomic design to promote user compliance and minimize discomfort or interface with job tasks. 4. Durability and quality. Evaluate the durability and quality of the PPE. It should be constructed from materials that can withstand the intended use and potential hazards. Check for any applicable standards or certifications that indicate the quality and reliability of the PPE. 5. Is compatibility. Consider the compatibility of different PPE components if multiple types and are required simultaneously. Ensure that they do not interfere with each other's functionality or compromise the overall effectiveness of protection. 6. Training and familiarity. Assess the availability of training and educational resources for proper use, maintenance, and storage of the selected PPE. Users should be adequately trained and familiar with the equipment to ensure correct usage and maximize protection. 7. Regulatory compliance. Understand and comply with relevant regulations, standards, and guidelines governing the use of PPE in your specific industry or jurisdiction. Ensure that the selected PPE meets the necessary re regulatory requirements. 8. Cost and availability. Uh, consider the cost of the PPE and its availability in the required quantity. While cost is a factor, it should not, and I emphasize not, compromise the safety and protection provided by the equipment. Do you know any PPE? You can pause this video and try and recall if you know any PPE, write them down, and then compare your answers to what you're going to be presenting in the next section. We have come to the end of the session. Thank you for watching. Give yourself a big hooray. And until next time, great time and God bless.